shining bright, gonna have a grand new show tonight. With glitz and glam on the marquee, perhaps a Tony nominee. Stars beam brightly, see them glow, sell out nightly, SRO. It's time to applaud the Broadway beat. Hello, I'm Richard Ridge, and welcome to Broadway Beat, our weekly half-hour behind-the-scenes look at the very best of the New York theater on Broadway and beyond. This week, we have a great show in store for you. We'll stop by the New Amsterdam Theater for the opening night celebration of one of this season's most highly anticipated new musicals, Mary Poppins, which is being produced by Disney and Cameron McIntosh. But let's start things off by meeting the cast and creative team of the new production of Stephen Sondheim's Company, which has just opened at the Ethel Barrymore Theater. Raul Esparza stars as Bobby in director John Doyle's new revival of the 1970 Stephen Sondheim George Firth musical, in which, like last season's Sweeney Todd, the actor musicians perform the score. <laughs> Did this show lend itself easier to the concept of the actor musicians than Sweeney Todd did? I don't know about easier. I would say that I, for personally, I think it works even better. Uh, I think it's somehow, the piece is more accessible. It's interesting doing a book musical, a naturalistic book musical, and carrying instruments around at the same time. That's very interesting. But uh, I would say the process was probably, it's not so, you know, it's not so hard, of course. And it's very interesting to have actors doing their text and then the music. That's interesting. But I, I think what works for, for me uh, is you kind of know why it's called company. They, all, they are all there all the time. They're omnipresent in his head. You understand why it's called what it is. And I, because otherwise you'd be waiting all night and you'd see somebody for two minutes, you know. So have a real sense of ensemble and entity within that is great. Talk about your rehearsal process for this. Was it different than Sweeney, the way you worked on things? They're all the same. They really are all the same. It's about a group of people coming together in a room and making music and trying to tell a story. Uh, I always start from not knowing what I'm going to do. Uh, I start from nothing, uh, an empty room, and build up the environment. Uh, what was good about this was, I, I think, the great bonus for me was I had two wonderful designers in David Gallo and Anne Ward and Tom Harsley, the lighting designer. And, you know, I was foolish enough to design Sweeney Todd and the costumes myself. So at least I had somebody to talk to this time, you know. Or somebody to say, is this rubbish? Shall we do something else? That was good. That was good. So, it's Before you had an answer to yourself, to hearing all these voices in your head, is this right? Is this right? Exactly right. But this has been so different, so collaborative and so wonderful. And of course, you know, I've known Mr. Sondheim better this time around. And that's marvelous because we're friends and we can communicate and work as collaborators together. And that's really special. You know, musical theater, musical comedy fans, everybody has a different take of what company is about. What is it about to you? Is it all in Robert's mind? Yes. It's all in his, tra it's trapped in his head. And he's stuck. And it has nothing to do with sexuality for me. It has nothing to do with all that. It's the same stuckness that you probably have and I've had and have at times and lots of the people in this room have. That's what's interesting. That, uh, and, and a piece that was written in 1970 that, to me anyway, seems as relevant, if not more relevant now than it ever was, is joyous. How did it work? Did, did you and John sit together and he sort of explained how characters were going to be and then you orchestrated from there and picked certain instruments? How did it work? Um, well, we had an idea of what we were walking in with as far as who played what. And, um, and I really came up with my own game plan coming in to start rehearsals and then we just adjusted from there so I made a lot of decisions early sort of without his input and then we did a lot of tweaking and fixing when he when we were in rehearsals so now the musical is orchestrated for how many instruments now and how many instruments are played in the show um, well there are 13 people that play instruments and then Bobby plays the piano for a brief period of time um, they all play multiple instruments so there's you know probably 
they all play at least two or three, <laughs> sometimes four. <laughs> Oh, the role is Harry. He's he's the alcoholic in denial. The karate, the karate with his wife. I play the trumpet and trombone, and I, I can't, you know. And I got to give credit to Mary Mitchell Campbell who did these orchestrations because I can't conceive, or even think about doing this role without a trumpet or a trombone in my hand. Because she she brought in all of the musical nuance that is Harry. I I, I remember at one point I asked Mary Mitchell, I said, "Can you give me something more lyrical, more legato, more beautiful?" And it wasn't right. Harry's, uh, all of the brass instrument hits and all of the licks that we play are indigenous to the character. And that's the way it happened with all of the other instruments as well. So it's it's a thrill to play an instrument, act a character, and sing a character all in one. I play David, who's, um, David and Jenny are a couple that are good friends of Bobby's and uh, rather um, fun-loving but conservative. Um, but it's, they, they're the couple that uh, have a little scene where we partake in a legal substance with Bobby. Oh, I'm so excited. I, I'm outside of my body. It's unbelievable. <laughs> this is my debut. So, oh, Congratulations. And you're also one of Bobby's girlfriends. Talk about the role that you play. I am. Uh, I play Kathy, who is essentially the one that got away. So he, I, I think I'm the one that uh, Bobby should have married. <laughs> anyway, it's set up that way, but she's marrying another another gentleman and moving away. So um, I'm Sarah, the karate wife. That's just I just say the karate wife because everyone knows that. Um, and I played the flute and the piccolo. I was a flute major in college, and then also the saxophone. And um, I played the piano too, but they didn't. They have wonderful piano players in this Matt Castle as well. So um, you know. The fact that we play the instruments really makes you be supportive of the rest of the people in the cast. You don't have a chance to just do your scene and then go down to the dressing room. You're staying on stage to support every single other person on stage. It gets the ego completely out of it. And that's just exactly what these people are on stage. I, I play percussion, and they're, you know, they're tricky. I, I never played percussion before. Um, I'm a pretty good musician. And uh, as a singer and whatnot, um, I play the triangle. It's my signature instrument. And the glockenspiel, which is very difficult and very scary. But it's getting better every night. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. But it's such a great treat. You're your Joanne and that wonderful song you get to sing? I sing Ladies Who Lunch, originated by Elaine Stritch, who came last night and was totally charming and, and very, very complimentary. And to me, it is uh, the, the way we're treating it uh, in this production is somewhat like a, an entire scene without applause, and uh, it just it, it has a vast uh, range and landscape from the beginning of my scene to the end of it. I mean, it's pivotal. I give Bobby the momentum for catapult him into being alive. Really, that's what it's there for. But for her, it's a great uh, it's it's a, a great journey into the audience into herself and it gets very dark and then she's left on a cliff and has to get herself out and uh, um, it's a, it's really the, the it's just so much fun and I love breaking the fourth wall with the audience it's just I'm like you've been waiting all night for this all right here it comes you know I mean it's just fun you know so uh, the actress is having fun and Joanne is having a blast you know I mean she is the most wonderful character just so full. Here's to the girls who stay smart, aren't they a gas? Rushing to their classes in optical art, wishing it would pass. Another long, exhausting day, another thousand dollars. A matinee, a kid to play, perhaps a piece of 
play Peter, and uh, I'm married to Susan, sort of. <laughs> uh, I think on the surface we appear to be the most happily married couple, which then is why it's such a funny shock when we say, "Oh no, we're getting divorced." You know, we haven't told anybody yet. You know, he comes back a month later or however long it is till our second scene. And he says, "So you two are not married?" Well, not since the divorce. You know, <laughs> it's, you know uh, so we're kind of wacky, I guess. I play piano, keyboards, and bass in the show. No, pretty equally distributed. Uh, I play Susan, who is the happiest divorced woman in New York, and uh, I'm from the South, which is interesting because I'm from Long Island originally. Um, and I play piano, uh, and I play uh, orchestra bells, which is a glockenspiel. So uh, I'm lucky I don't have to actually push anything around the stage. Do you have a favorite moment in the show that you do? Um, I'm partial to the solo that I do in Getting Married Today, my uh, wedding singer solo. I just, you know, I just love being a part of that that whole song. It's just an incredible piece of music, and to even be a small part of it is really great. Well, I play Larry, and I play the clarinet, and I play a little percussion as well. How much of the instruments did you know already going into this? Well, I played clarinet since I was in about fourth grade um, for many, many years, uh, but this is the first time I got to actually use it in, uh, in a theater capacity. Um, and was it interesting for you to work on doing a role and playing instruments at the same time? Yeah, I mean, it was challenging to try to incorporate that the instrument into the character, um, both sort of conceptually as well as physically. And there's just also just technically some really fascinating things related to playing a wind instrument and singing that, and having to do back to go back and forth between the two very quickly. That were challenging, you know. When you could never find a teacher who could explain to you, you know, how you could manage your airflow between playing the clarinet and singing, because there is no one who teaches that. You just had to figure it out yourself. Make me alive. Make me Bobby's at a point of crisis in his life because it's his 35th birthday and I think that the show is about someone who has looked at their life and has to learn to accept things that they may not like about themselves and begin to grow up. I think it's very much about someone growing up and, and taking a step to um, become everything they were finally supposed to be without anybody else telling them who they are. What amazed me is this show was written in 1970. I saw it then. It is as relevant today as it was then. Would you agree? I absolutely agree. And you know, the show has been called Dated, and they have said that the book is not good enough. And I think that this show, the production puts the lie to that, that the, the show is a groundbreaking piece of musical theater that is a masterpiece. I've seen many, many productions of it, and I've enjoyed them all. But I never knew that it was this good. And I feel like it was just written. And audiences respond like it was just written. And I don't know if it's just that the times have caught up to it, or it's just the, these men were 36 years ahead of their time. I, I, I don't know what it is. But all it is is that they put New Yorkers on stage, being New Yorkers, and made them sing. And made them sing about all those things that they're ambivalent about, which we all relate to. And I think that the show is its just simply not dated. And part of that is John's work. Part of that is Mary Mitchell's work because she took the music and, and took the, the 70s sound out of it. And part of it is just the show itself. If you really look at it, it's just about people. That's what it's really about, isn't it? That's what it's really about, really are, isn't it? The new Disney Cameron Mackintosh musical, Mary Poppins, which has just opened at the New Amsterdam Theatre, features the perfect blending of the 1964 classic Academy Award winning film and the popular P.L. Travers books. Under the direction of Richard Eyre, this beloved nanny is once again flying into the lives of the Banks family, leaving her charms and ways. We drop by their opening night to chat with the company of Mary Poppins.
I was introduced to Pamela Travers in 1993, and she was a, a feisty, uh, though frail, 93-year-old at that point. And I think she had decided that, you know, I was the most likely person to uh, to bring her dream of having Mary Poppins on the musical stage to fruition. And even though she, I, I suspect, knew that she probably wouldn't see it herself, though I do feel she was in the house tonight, and that, in fact, her grandchildren are here as well, which is which has been marvellous. Um, and I think she decided that she'd entrust me with her stories um, when she knew that I actually uh, knew her books and her characters very well. And for me, it was her brilliant turn of phrase, which was the key to doing it on the stage. Um, I think it, Julie Andrews absolutely captured the spirit of Peel Travers's work in her brilliant portrayal on the, in the movies, which is why Pamela always stayed great friends with Julie. Um, but her actual language to, uh, is the thing that m makes it very, makes the stories very, very special, and was the key to unlocking how to dramatise it on the stage in a different way, um, using and uh, sort of reinventing some of the great um, Sherman Brothers songs, plus with George Sars and Anthony Jew's new work. You know, we were able to um, add some songs which um, uh, I'm delighted that the, the Sherman brothers said that he would have been proud to have written as well. It's a, it's a, in every department, it's been a very happy marriage. And, you know, um, from my point of view, it was when Tom Schumacher became head of Disney Theatrical and started the, to discuss with me what I, I'd always had in mind. Um, we've managed to, between us, produce the show that I always dreamed of. Take me back to the beginning when you first started working on it. It's a beautiful combination of the film and the books. Tell me what the challenges were and how you um, viewed it and saw it. The challenges were really how, partly how you merge the, the book and books and the film, but really what story you tell and how you tell the story. So the, the difficulty was deciding exactly what the story was. And when we decided the story unequivocally is about an unhappy family and how that happy that family becomes healed by the intervention of this being from I don't know where she's from maybe you can tell me uh, once you've decided that that's the narrative then it becomes much easier to decide where you put the the songs that uh, you know from the movie and exactly how you shape the story because you have a spine to the narrative and that's what of course grasps the audience I mean, I think obviously there are always things you have to leave out that you love because, you know, you can't ask the audience to bring a sleeping bag. I mean, there's going to be a moment when they're allowed to go home. Um, and of course there are choices and you, and you try. But in certain things, like for instance, in Jolly Holiday, because we couldn't do cartoons and, you know, it's the stage, and to a certain extent dance has replaced animation. But we, you know, from the books came the thing of the statues coming alive because that's a book story that wasn't done in the film. So it's really a... But Jolly Holiday was invented for the film, so it's it's a complete marriage of the film and the books. I I hope. The hardest part really was when we changed their songs. It was you know it, it, in a way it was an easier job to be given a brief and say will you write a song to cover this part of the story if it was new. It was when it was rewriting Jolly Holiday or Supercalifragilistic or Step in Time that it was more daunting because we knew how popular those songs were with the public and we but, thought you know there might be a public flogging outside the theatre if people didn't like them. But at the same time, because we are songwriters and we've been writing songs together for 23 years, we know and we kind of defended them in the most, probably the, the most rabid way because we said, but you can't change that. If you change that, then the whole song doesn't work. So I guess we were probably staunch defenders of the faith as well. Well, I actually, actually, Julie Andrews heard some of the songs we had written for the, for the original version that we had been working on. And uh, there was one number that she didn't particularly uh, cotton to. She, didn't, she felt it was a very pretty song, but it wasn't the right thing for a certain scene. And she said, I want something with a little more snap to it. And so my brother and I said, let's get a little slogan, a little sort of a phrase. And we tried to think of an original phrase, like an apple a day keeps the doctor away, that type of thing. And we kept trying and trying. And one day, Bob's son, my brother's son, said, uh, uh, we had the salt vaccine today. And Bob said, did it hurt? He said, oh, no, no, they put it on a lump of sugar and we took it down. He came in with a glazed look the next day. And he said, I've got a title. I think we got a good thing. So I said, what is it? And then he said, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Wow, I said, that's one of the worst titles I've ever heard in my life. No, 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 that's a great title. It's like, you know, and we started working on it, and that's, that's the origin of A Spoonful of Sugar. And Julie loved it. Snap, 
the job's a game. Remember that? That's in it. Well, what I love about the show is that the 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 choreography needed for it had to be very varied because of, it's not like a show that has a, a particular style. It needs lots of styles because each number requires something different. So you'll see in the show, it's there's a tap number, there's a sort of slightly balletic number, there's a gestural number, the super kind of fragilistic. Um, and that really appealed to me as a choreographer, and that's why I've got a partner as a choreographer, Stephen Meir, um, that we could bring our strengths together and, and it needed us to make this show. Um, the other thing that attracted me was, if you read the books of P.L. Travers, they're, constant, they're full of dance reference. She loved the idea of dancing being a, an escape and something that the more you danced, you would take off off the ground and you eventually fly, of course. So it was, she equated dancing with flying and joy, and I think that's something we, that gave us the encouragement to make this a dance show. I'm one of those people who, where it's not really all come together ever. Uh, I mean, there are there are a couple moments in the show I'm still tinkering with, and and I love to keep that alive. Otherwise, you're just doing the same darn thing over and over again. You know, there are things I want to solve a little better. Uh, so I guess it, it is. It's definitely comfortable in my body, in uh, and in my heart. Um, but I'm still working, baby. Well, obviously they made her an actress in this, which I, you know, I'm not sure if there's anything in my performance that suggests that. But but I'm glad that they that they took the suffragette line out because it sort of muddies the plot. And uh, I just love this character. I, you know, I strive to be the strong, uh, you know, graceful woman that she is. You know, and I love the journey that Winifred takes and how she uh, finds herself, finds finds a way for her to be the wife and mother that she wants to be, and she becomes sort of the leader of the family in, in the end. And I just love that about her. And she's wit and humor and all that, too. You know, it's a great, great, great part. Chim, chim, honey, chim, chim, honey, chim, chim, cherie. A sweep is as lucky as lucky can be. Chim, chim, honey, chim, chim, honey, chim, chim, cherie. Good luck will rub off when he shakes hands with you. Or blow me a kiss. But... And that's lucky, too. I feel ecstatic. It's a major dream come true for me. Um, I don't think many um, London actors, musical theatre actors, certainly get to ever come to Broadway. And um, so when they finally said, yeah, we'd, we'd like you to come, it was like, yes. And um, the audiences here are, they're more vocal, they're... They're not more appreciative than London audiences. They're very appreciative, but they're more vocal. And as an actor, when you're on stage and you hear the roar during the bows or the end of Step in Time or Jolly Holiday, it's it's just such, it's so rewarding and it's a buzz that they're loving it. And and that's why we do it. Actors, I think, in the end, they just want to show off and get a, get you know applause for it. <laughs> you get enough of it in the show. Talk about this wonderful role of Bert that you've inhabited. Well. Um, I, when I got the role, I had never seen the film all the way through. I don't know how I missed it, but um, once I got the role, my wife rushed, rushed straight out, bought the DVD. We sat down and watched it, and I watched Dick Van Dyke, obviously, and it was quite daunting because he's brilliant. Julie Andrews, Dick Van Dyke, the whole cast, they're brilliant in the film. And you think, oh, God, I've got to fill those shoes. But what I love about this show is they, they haven't just picked up the film and put it on stage um, they've gone back to the P.L. Travers books which I think there's five or six of them and the creative team have picked out all their all the best bits that didn't make it into the film and then they've gone back to the film and picked all the best bits out of the film and hopefully put it all in one show and so it wasn't like I had to do uh, a Dick Van Dyke I could do I read the script and I felt I knew what I could do with the role and um, I, I sort of went for the physicality first um, I just think he's a very energized guy he's he 
he he's in love with Mary Poppins. Nothing's ever going to happen between them, but he's there and he's cheeky to her and he pushes his luck with her and uh, that's sort of where I started. And then after I'd got the physicality, um, I went more for the the acting, the singing, the dancing, how to you know incorporate them into the this character. I just kind of came at it as my point of view. I just kind of made her my own and because. Julie Andrews did an like she hit the nail on the head with her portrayal of the role and you know she just did such a good job so I tried to not recreate that I just tried to really experience her as you know as a woman and just tried to bring myself to it and you know make a little difference so because I knew everybody had I have Julie Andrews ingrained in my head you know so it's a little it's a little pressure you know so I've tried to take it and do my own things with it like my humor and different things like that. And talk about the songs, the Sherman songs and the new songs. Did you, how well did you know the songs before? Oh, I had them, like my first music rehearsal, I was like, just a spoonful. You know, I knew all the words and everything. So, And then the new music couldn't be more beautiful, more appropriate. I mean, it just all blends so well. And, um, you know, just working with all these people and putting the music together is great. And working with your co-star, Gavin Lee, what yeah. that's been like. Oh, he's so wonderful. I couldn't be more blessed with a better leading man. And we get along so well. And it was intimidating. He's done the show for two years in London. He knew all the steps, all the everything, has, you know, had other Marys and everything. But he couldn't have been more patient and more giving in rehearsals and just never made me feel like I was behind or anything like that. And we just really worked together. And he... You know, we just, he has become, you know, a different bird. You know, we have different reactions. I'm, you know, brought something different. And he's really, you know, he wasn't like, do it like this. You know, it was all like we just created our own thing.